at least use the system from Olympia North. Well, I stood on the Capitol Peak repeater system board and I thought, I'm going to approach these guys on, the, on my board and see if we can put up a, a new digi on Capitol Peak. The last fall at the summer gathering, I, I talked to, uh, to one of the DNR techs and he told me that, that we could, um, he led me to believe, I guess, that we could use the system with a, with a D700 and a simple band pass tool. Well, it's a DNR site. And about last week, I found out the band pass filter isn't going to be a solution. He wants dual load isolator and a, and a tube cavity. Well, in January, we bought a D700, and I've been running it down in this area, down in this area right here. It's really not sitting on the peak. It's running now. As a, at about 200 feet. Um, so I need to talk to some 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 brain power here today. Hello, Ward. Um, I'm thinking maybe of going to a a um, uh, commercial, an old commercial, really like a G GE Master II, rather than hacked into a brand new D700 to separate audio in and out that it received the transfer. <coughs> I'm sorry, this whole the whole system is on 440-875. But um, so I kind of thrown it's kind of thrown a, a monkey wrench into the into the addition of capital P because it once we get, and, and the board of Capitol Peak will, we will do this. And it's just a matter of now figuring out the best way to meet in our filtering requirement. But once we get this thing up on the peak, which is about 2,800 feet, it'll open up, it, it'll be a direct shot here. And then from here to here is a direct shot. We have an eye gate. So packets coming from here to here get to the internet and from here to here I've added an inter internet gateway an internet gateway here so the packets coming from here will get to the internet but this will open up clear down to the beach down into Lewis County probably down into the Longview Kelso area along I-5 this area is pretty hilly. It's always hard to get to get coverage in that area. But, but that, and it also will backfill every all these areas along here that that Uvalde does, doesn't pick up. So it's, it would be a good addition to the system. It's just going to be a it's a low management problem right now trying to meet the our requirements. But uh, if anybody. No, we've got, we, what we did is we bought a D700. We got the band pass filter and the tune cabinet. I mean, not in the, uh, the dual isolator. But I don't really want to go hack a brand new D700, physically go in and grab audio. You know, we have to separate, transmit, and receive audio. And I think that a, an older commercial radio, at least in my mind, would be a better solution to that one. And take the V700 and resell it or put it somewhere else. <clears throat> this this system, I kind of got a kick out of this. Right after Bob's kind of kept this a secret system here for from 2002 until last summer. Not really a secret, but it was never really a never really a public discussion. But last summer he did a good talk at the summer gathering and it kicked out a lot of interest in people that wanted to try the 9600 system on UHF. Well, Herb, being 
a quiet guy heard this, he decided to post an announcement on the tapper stick saying, you know, hey, Bob built this great system out here in the Pacific Northwest, join in on UHF. And uh, what do you guys think of it? Well, they, they thought it was, it won't work. It costs too much and it's too complicated. I captured a, a few comments from some, some of the guy, three guys on with the sick. Um, Steve is the guy that runs the, the um, findyou.com. He says it's, uh, you know, and, and, and it's probably the, the comments that, that these, these comments are all correct. You know, the, the transition won't. Worldwide, we'll never go to 9600 because it's complicated, it's expensive, and it, it, uh, we hands probably won't spend the money for it. <coughs> and but that's that was a one comment. Bob Dominguez, with his usual, you know, he, he said that the uh, VHF is 90 me better than UHF for all me. Has uh, less motor path and fading. Uh, APRS at UHF will have practical applications, but serving the general distribution will never be as good as VHF. And this guy, I think this was a response to one of Bill's comments about the increasing bandwidth. <coughs> but it, in my opinion, APR should be kept simple because it functions better that way. Well, there is a way to make this system function simple. Bob, Bob and others, like pretty much the infrastructure exists. It's operating, it works well, it works well in the area that we, talk, that we talked about. It won't, it's not going to work out here, it's not going to work in eastern Washington because the infrastructure is not there. But with the, with the system that's designed, I mean that's, that's operating right now, it works and it works well. <clears throat> last, last week in one of the mail reflectors, somebody said, is anybody using 9600? And there was a couple of comments. And then finally someone came out and said, well, the guys in the um, Seattle region are using it. And then someone came out with a long posting and he says, well, I tried it with a couple of these sevens and I didn't get near the packet they did with the, um, you know, running the 1200 baud. And I tried this and he had uh, about two pages of why it didn't work. And my buddy James up in Edmonton, he came back and he says, well, you should, you know, all these are fine and good, but they've been using it in the uh, Northwest for, you know, five years and it's working great. And that was the end of the discussion. You should go try it. You know, science theory is one thing, but you should go see what it's, how it's really working. And it was, it was funny, the whole conversation just stopped. It doesn't happen often. <laughs> okay, the, how do we use this system? Well, Herb was, was, has commented on the D700 and the D7 Kenwood radio. That is the easy, it's the easiest solution for users to make use of the system, the infrastructure that's there. Um, Bill, spoke, and Dave, uh, K7 GPS, have put together some uh, good information, very good information on on how to set the D700 and the D7 up. And basically the D700 is just a matter of changing the frequency, changing the data band, <coughs> changing the pack, transmit, or the quad rating. I love speaking this company. Anyway, Bill's, uh, Scott, Scott, right? I was going to try to bring up this website, but Bill's website is a wiki page 
and it's in cable format. And it's kind of the way we have our D700 set up. It shows the, um, I think in column four, column five, is, the, is all of the setups necessary to take your D700 and get it set to 9600 baud operation on your check. Um, Dave's is off of the Northwest, main Northwest info page, and his is in text format. He starts his discussion off in, in the setup of using the D700 as a, uh, as a digi, and I think it's the second or third item on his list, talks about the actual setups of how to take the radio and set it up for deep for 9600 baud operation. I need to take a breath. Is there, Tom? Could you make a comment, maybe about your your operating um, the system? Yeah, we uh, uh, speak loud. For those of you who uh, don't have a D7, uh, what pilot? <laughs> That's my recommendation. Uh, I've used all the radios you can uh, possibly have, and uh, D700. From my point of view, for a mobile radio, for being able to switch back and forth between operational modes, it's just... It's slick. <laughs> hey, sir. Um, exceptionally good radio. What I do is I have uh, um, a PMs on the D700 set up, so when you're going down the road um, in an area where there isn't any 600 and you're using uh, APRS, uh, just have it uh, set up so that one of the band is running that VHF and the other one's on on something else for voice. But as soon as I come into an area where there's 9600 baht around, well, like last weekend, I was up uh, in the Skagit Valley area, and uh, I knew I was getting close to this place. I just hit PM1, it clicked over the, the setup to 9600 baht, and there you're on 9600 baht. So it was that fast to switch back and forth once you have it configured. And it works. I'll tell you, I was up in uh, Cobble Hills, which is north of Victoria, a few months back. And all the way up there, you can get all the way back to Skagit, Skagit Valley on UHF. So these guys would say it doesn't work. I can tell you it works. There are areas out in the mountains, and I was shaking my head no, and Kim asked me if it works in my house. At my house it doesn't work, but I go a thousand feet to the east out in the open field of my place, and it works great. Uh, if you ever out to the summer gathering, you can run 9600 baht from the picnic site, which is fun. Bach can attest to that. We've had it running out there uh, several times. And eventually we'll, uh, we'll have something set up so we can switch on a digital or something out there for the summer gathering. But that, uh, that good. <laughs> yeah, I've got a tower now out there at the picnic shelter and we can put antennas on it and uh, power and uh, wireless. We can even have to actually have an eye gate sitting out there while we're running. Uh, so that's uh, and an excellent way to go. And I would highly recommend looking at the D700. We use these sites. Um, Bill's site is excellent for getting up and done. Thank you, Tom. Uh, question. His, his question was uh, to um, what's the advantages of using 9600 UHF system over the other? Um, it's fun. Uh, it's uh, Bob's original. Okay, you want to answer that one? You know, that's a really good question. The chief advantage here is the length of the packets. The packets are about one-eighth the length on 9600 than they are on um, 1200 baht. And so you get a much higher throughput rate. If you go down to uh, 2 meters, 144, 39, listen to 1200 baht packets, you're going to hear nothing, almost, especially during the daytime, nothing but solid packets, especially in the Seattle area one right after the other. Well, what I have done is I, I gated all the RF from two meters onto the UHF at 440875, and you still have plenty of room. You, you can put two more, two meters, on 440875. So the throughput is much higher. You have less, because the packets are shorter, you have less chance of all the, the garbage that you hear, the, the fading, the, um, uh, static, anything else, collisions, 
What's the best chance for collisions on, uh, on 96 and Bob than you do on 1200 bars? So there's a tremendous advantage. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> Good point. That's the fun part. You want resolution for your path, for your track? I beacon every 30 seconds. You do that down on two meters and they're going to come find you. <laughs> so it's much, much better. Go ahead, Bill. No, there is no buffer. It feeds directly because uh, the packets are shorter on, two, on, on uh, 440. You don't need a buffer. It just transmits them right away. You know, there's some internal uh, delay because of computer action and stuff like that. But no, it doesn't need to stack. Just no stacking at all. It just goes out. I say Junior is a lot faster here. Even though there's four messages in here, the message is recording. But it's not screaming. I'm going to bring you back to it. Okay, don't bring your bucket pack. It's going to like crap. Now you sit in the bucket pack, it's going to like. Like white noise. Okay, some of the other solutions besides the, the Kenwood radio, uh, Bob has listed the ICOM 207, 208, the AC 78, and the 8800 and the uh, Alinko uh, 435. The Alinko sells a PNC, a, a test of PNC had on. I've never heard anybody that's had any success with that. Have you? There's a table that was distributed on the Logic uh, website that uh, has a, uh, a bit error rating, rating for a number of radios at uh, 9600. I was wondering if that's uh, a reliable table. Is that a one-time deal? Should we be paying a lot of attention to that? Uh, or do you know of any other uh, performance metrics that have been published on different radios? Can anybody answer that? Is that okay. I was on the wall up there. Who posted it? They do probably copy it and didn't even read it. Yeah. Didn't you? <laughs> Forward this, FYI. Here's some TNCs that, uh, uh, 9600 bought TNCs. Um, you're using this one? I'm thinking that might be the one to add on the capital P system. I'm sorry. Uh, this is one plus is around about 300 bucks, 300 bucks. The time they pick 96 is, is about 200 bucks, just over 200 bucks. The ID at KC7 Multi, uh, you get it from Lebo in Germany, and it's just there. Uh, it costs around $230, 210 euros or something like that. But, yeah, 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 yeah I mean, however, there, there's a group from Mercia Island that bought um, five of them and they got a big price break. They got it for 170 bucks. So I mean, that's a pretty good deal. Now here's an interesting uh, TNC. It's STS Track DSP TNC. It does a whole bunch of stuff. But it's a DSP based TNC and it's not nearly as critical uh, for receiving as some of the other ones. And uh, it, it shows possible. I haven't used it, but the uh, testimonies they have on their site say it's really good. It works very, very well. And it's around $200. So you can really spend it for Let's get one cheaper one is the total about one case of two and what they do for them. Yeah, so do you have a question? Yes. And this is what we're going to say we're picking all of those. Hey, Bill wanted to relate something to Kobe's. They wanted me to bring it, but I told them I'm not going to bring it. I'll show, bring a picture. This is the radio. I bought it from the Wemo distributor in Germany also. This is, can you hear me? 
and the FDD, uh, the PSD bitter, and the DD9 bitter. There's no dials, no LEDs, nothing else. It's power keys, the DD9 connector. Uh, it's programmed, <coughs> I think it's, I think it holds 12 predefined frequencies. They'll transmit on either one, one watt or 10 watts. And um, so basically can't screw too much up there. But I managed to. I changed, I, uh, this is the 9612 Plus. That was the radio that, or the PNC that I have hooked up to. Oops. To that, to that radio. I find it. Okay. Oh, uh, Somebody help me? Scott? How do I get to the end? Go through the whole thing again. Okay, show that. Anyway, that's, that's the radio. And that's the PNC. Well, I spent about a month trying to set the deviation level on that stupid PNC. And if you know KPC, there's an X level to command. And you, can, and you can also do it automatically with a down arrow, up arrow. Tried that, and I ended up manually going from like 30, 31, 32, 33, all the way up to 250. Never is going to get it working. I took Bob, I finally started whining to Bob. He says, well, I borrowed Ken's um, service monitor. He says, I got it for a week. If you can come up here, I'll look at it. So we put it on the service monitor and found out even at a level of 10, it was overdriving his service monitor on deviation. Well, there's a, there's a jumper in here that sets high, high deviation, low deviation, I guess it is. And I had to change that over to low deviation. And now we've got it set at 220, with this jumper set at low, and which probably equates to millivolts. It's probably going about 220 millivolts. And it works now. I just gotta get the DG set up to operate. Right now I'm just receiving on this and then porting the packets into the internet. But uh, so the easy way is the Kenwood no radio. The hard way and really you can't, you can't set deviation by your ear. Those, the, the packets of, at a level of 10 and a level of 220 sound exactly the same. Can't do it by by ear. So, if you want to set this up, maybe summer gathering, Bob will bring the service monitor in and bring your stuff to summer gathering, and we'll get the he'll get the uh, deviation set right. Any questions there? Okay. <clears throat> What's next with this system? Law posted on the on the Northwest Aviator on February, first part of February, that I'm thinking about changing the UHF preferred path to U1-1 and U2-1 for mobiles. I looked at that and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm using a separate secondary ID just so that I can go back to the internet and see what system I'm going coming through. I use the dash 9 when I'm on 9600, I use the dash 7 when I'm on the 12 minutes of the box. I, He's posted, what's the pros and the cons to this? I'm going to let Bob come up and, and uh, tell us what he's thinking as far as this area, and then, and then we'll open for discussion, open for questions, and finish up a little early, unlike her. <laughs> okay, it is short. Um, but that really doesn't make any difference. I found out after talking to some of the guys who really know, and I don't really know, about packet length. The address field 
for the packets, for, for unconnected packets, is exactly the same if you use U1 or this is the packet that's going to go Y1. <laughs> you know, if you actually put that in there, so it doesn't make any difference. So it then became just a matter of putting something in that's distinctive to the UHF networks. So I changed my idea from U11 and U21 to 96 UHF 1 dash 1 and 96 UHF 2 dash 1. The purpose for that is so that if any of the packets, because of misconfiguration or just mistakes in gates or or any any other thing that, that people fool around with with UHF and, and uh, VHF APRS so that the packets on the UHF site will not propagate at all on the VHF site and the packets on the VHF site that come across accidentally will no way propagate through the UHF system. It just kills. Now, if you know how to do it in the gates and do it properly, you can change, as it goes through the gate, you can change the, uh, the way the packet is propagated. But I'd rather not discuss that here now because people will get it mixed up. How many really understand what the path is? There's not very many. So, okay, I see a few nodding their heads. Yeah, okay, very good, thank you. Uh, if, you, if you're new to APRS, you will not understand this. It, it's going to be a little bit. The learning curve is, as, as Herb said, a little bit steep in the beginning. But once you get past that steep thing and learn the lessons, then this becomes secondhand. It's very, very easy. And you learn how to set your packets. Even now, though, even now, there are people who don't want to learn and will put bad paths in their packets and they'll get all messed up through the system. But that's very, very small. It's only less than 2 or 3% now. The whole idea is to keep an identity to the packets that are generated on the 440 network, separate from the packets that are generated on the 144 network. So starting right now, I request that anybody who has any UHF equipment on APRS change their path to APRS via 96 UHF 1 1 comma UHF uh, 96 UHF 2 1 for a mobile station and just 96 UHF 2 2 for a home station. Yes, yes. Well, we'll send it out on the SIG. We'll We'll get a broadcast any, any way we can. There is one disadvantage to this, and it's, it's a small disadvantage. If someone comes from out of the area and they have their path set for Y, they're going to have to change it to get into the 9600 system. I really think if UHF takes off that the VHF packets should be changed to VHF or, you know, 1-1, 2-1. But in my lifetime, I don't think that will ever really happen because it, it takes a big thing to make any change. We can make that change here now in the Pacific Northwest because the group is relatively small and it's easy to get the word out. So it's, and it's right at the beginning of, of the UHS system and making it work. So it's an easy kind of thing to implement. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. So if you've got a... Yeah, that's correct. Exactly. Okay, sir. That's a good question. There's no reason in the world why you cannot do this on, on VHF. You can run 9600 on VHF. The bandwidth is the same. It's exactly the same for 1200 baud as it is for 9600 baud. And you may get better results by doing it on two meters. The only reason I picked uh, 440 was because it's a world that's wide open and it's very easy to, 
to get space and frequency there. Yeah, oh, another good one, another good one. Yes. Two twenty should have been with the yeah, absolutely. I am, I'm, I'm for that. So getting getting both twelve hundred baud and ninety six hundred baud on on UHF. There is a two twenty frequency on APRS right now. It's two two four two two zero four hundred. I think two two three four hundred. Thank you. Yeah, two two three four hundred. And uh, they have a, it. It works at my house and it works on the, the Metro Tower downtown. There's a, a digi down there on that, and that covers quite an area. And also, at Richard's place out in, uh, in Whitney, out in the uh, West Gadget Valley, he has 220 up there too, all APRS. And, and Brad, are you going to do that too? Yeah, cool, okay, very good. So, yeah, we can go, all really good ideas, and we need to, we need to do that kind of thing. 220 frequency, will also be available for all kinds of other things like Windlink and, um, and whatever else that, that uh, comes along. It is active right now on Windlink. So, and we can share all these frequencies. There's no reason why we can't. And it works well, especially on 220. Okay, who wants the hat? I, <laughs> I see two go up. I'll give you the most here first. Yeah, I'm old enough. Any other questions? Let's go ahead, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yours is. His doesn't trail you. But I think the Mercer Island, is anybody from the Mercer Island Radio Club here? Are you guys doing it at 9600 baud Windy? Uh, yes. I think you are. Yes, we are. Yeah, on, uh, but you're doing a 440 uh, 800 or? Yeah. So to answer your question, yes, but you got to find the frequency. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Thank you. Let's uh, return it back to Herb. Okay, uh, thank you, Kim, and Bob, for your...